Hello everyone and welcome to the supplementary video. We're in this room where we had to make a choice on which door to go through, the left or the right. The correct choice was the left one, and we never even went into the right one at all, so uh, let's see what happens if we use our goblet of water on that. We do find a sword, but it's not Alf's dagger, it's something else. We don't get a cutscene when we pick it up. Alf is not here. Well, that's because we don't have his dagger, so we don't have that close connection to him at this point. What did we pick up? So now we have Eternity, the Dragon Sword. This thing's as light as a feather, you know? Death, Adam, is as light as a feather. Duty is as heavy as a rock. Use it well. Thank you. So a strange thing is that we've never actually heard of this before. It's actually the best weapon in the game, uh, so why are we picking it up now in the middle of the game when no one's even mentioned it yet? Well, let's first see what it does. It can shoot out a projectile, and it can also be used as a melee weapon. It works like the sword does, but I think it is more powerful than the rusty sword. But when it charges up, we can shoot a projectile. So. This is, I think, the best weapon in the game. So it seems kind of strange that we're picking it up now, doesn't it? Especially since apparently Adam and uh, Rebecca have heard of the sword, even though at this point in the game, I don't think we've heard anyone mention it yet. So why are we getting it now? Well, maybe let's step out of the room and see what happens when Belial comes up. So I don't think this scene is any different. Belial walks up to us, and I'm just gonna skip to the choices here. So, we had to make a choice to figure out how to survive this encounter with Belial. And there's a choice that's missing here. Let's see, there's let's get out of here, just ignore Belial and leave. Uh, just give Belial the shrive, or attack Belial. Well, the correct choice, the one we chose, was something else. It was, um, what shrive? We were playing dumb, and then uh, Adam pulled out Alf's dagger and shot Belial in the face, because as Alf said, his dagger would provide us as a uh, sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card for one time only against Belial. So that's how we survived that encounter. But we don't have Alf's dagger. We have Eternity, which is a better weapon, but it doesn't have that one-time ability. So what should we choose here now that the correct choice is gone? Well, let's try just leaving. Let's say, let's get out of here. What have you done? The Shrive, please. No, Belial is not gonna let us just walk away. He's using his magic to hold us in place. Uh, so escaping is not an option. Well, it's not like we're just gonna give him the Shrive, so uh, maybe let's use our Dragon Sword to attack Belial. Shrive, please. Here, goddammit. <laughs> the gloves work. Florentine was wrong. I will be master. Master of all. Starting with you. So that didn't turn out so well. Um, yeah, trying to at attack Belial just resulted in the same result as trying to escape, and then it automatically went to our last choice, which is just to give Belial the Shrive. Uh, Belial wearing some kind of strange gloves that allow him to touch the Shrive. Maybe we'll learn more about that later on, who knows. But they did look like they were maybe made out of skin with brands on them. And apparently without them, Belial would not have been able to touch the Shrive. But he is, and uh, now that he had the Shrive, he had no need for Adam and Rebecca, so he just killed us. So yeah, Belial is powerful, and uh, the only way you can survive is if you get Alf's dagger and choose that one particular choice where you shoot him. So yeah, going in the right-hand door just results in death, 
There actually is no way to survive that. There's no way to, to take Eternity the Dragon Sword out of there. So even though that's the best weapon, we can't have it yet. It shows up, but we have to leave it there. Because, uh, hold on, let me just load that up. Because if we go back, skip this cutscene. Uh, talking to Hawk right now. Alright, we can take Alf's dagger. Oh, let's just skip the cutscenes. Alright, talk to Belial. Go to the next chapter. Okay, we can... Let me get into that other room with the other cup. Yep, I mean, that, that enemy is going to be for next time. New enemies popping up to get in our face. They're not too happy with us, but we're not paying attention to them right now. Alright, I have the other cup. Let's go to the right-hand door. And it's empty. Nothing here. So Eternity is gone if we open the door second. So yeah, no way to get Eternity. No way to take it out of here. The only correct choice is to go in the left door, take Alf's dagger, and walk out with that. Oh, hey, that's just rude. So yeah, that's how else the Belial encounter can go. There's only one correct choice, and everything else just results in death. Okay, we picked up a few documents that we should take a look at. One of them was the Requiem Maze map, and uh, let's just put the whole thing on screen right here. So as I mentioned, we're going to be going through this maze in a future video, and uh, this map is very, very useful to have as you're doing that, because this is a more complex maze than the caverns, and requires getting a lot more mandatory items than the caverns did. Sketch of a sword. Like no sword I've ever seen. What's that smudge towards the top of the pommel? So yeah, the sketch of the sword. We may recognize what this is. We just picked it up. It's Eternity, the Dragon Sword. Didn't seem like it had anything on its pommel, though. Didn't seem like there was anything there. But yet it appears that this is the sword that we had just taken. Sketch of somewhere. Some place we've not yet come across. And yeah, once again, there, here's the entire image of this particular map of something that we don't know what it is. There's some planets and then some sort of... I, I don't know what it is. Does not seem familiar. Hmm. Solar system. Venus marked for some reason. Most like Earth of all planets. Also known as the Morning Star. The planet that marks Lucifer in the sky. Yeah, and here's the entire star chart all at once. No real information to get from that. But where we are going to get some information is the journal. I'm feeling this book holds the answer to quite a few questions. No doubt. Let's go through it thoroughly and systematically, okay? Yep, that's what we're going to be doing. Okay, so there's nine pages. Let's read through all of them and see what we get from this. Claude Florentine. Entry, the morning of the 15th of January, 1330 A.D. The Temple of the Morning Star. No fewer than 22 acolytes have entered the tower since our efforts begun two weeks ago, with only one returning in the intervening time. This man, Thomas, swore that he had met with someone within the tower who named himself the Gardener. Thomas swore to the power that this Gardener aided him in his escape only moments before gibbering madness of the ire fell upon him. Unfortunately, this experience has had an adverse effect on the man who has relapsed into a cerebral state of withdrawal. His body could be used to sate the hunger of the One Power if he proves to be of no further use to us. Goats and poultry can be expensive and sometimes ineffectual. Of the testimony of Thomas concerning the existence of this gardener, I must say but that I am skeptical. Whether what he saw was figment or truth, I cannot say, but Belial reliably informs us that the last of the gardeners perished at the fall of the stone. I must take his word as truth. So what do we learn from this? 
Well, Claude Florentine does appear to be the head of the Temple of the Morning Star. Uh, something about going into the tower with a whole bunch of acolytes and only one person surviving and that person going mad. And uh, they met the gardener in the tower, this Thomas did, and that must be Raphael. So Raphael, apparently around for a long time, this was written in 1330 AD, so Raphael has uh, some years on him as well. Let's go on to the next page. I think I skipped one. Yeah. That's the second page. Claude Florentine. Entry, the afternoon of the 17th of January, 1330 AD. The Temple of the Morning Star. Following our initial experiment, it is clear to me that magical means should be employed for safety. After many long hours of reading and speculating, I have located the seal and sigil of Minion Gaziel, one of the lesser powers. On the last crossing to the tower, the power Gaziel headed my call to guide Belial and I through the labyrinth void, misleading the ire as we traveled. Eventually, we happened upon the chamber of the Soul Stone within the realm of Shoal. Our order now stand upon the threshold of the first of the great days. The first shard of the stone is now prepared. We are preparing for the next crossing. The stars are aligned and the portents are favorable. For the greater cause of the power, we walk to the tower. For the first time, we walk without fear of the ire. So it sounds like Florentine is now able to go through the tower without having to worry about the ire getting to him, thanks to this Gaziel, who is described as a minion and a lesser power. So whatever Gaziel is, doesn't sound human. Apparently Florentine has been, been to the realm of Shoal and has found the Soul Stone which apparently is something that is very important to whatever it is that Florentine is trying to do. Let's go on to page three. Claude Florentine. Entry the morning of the 25th of January, 1330 AD. Temple Cottage. All went as planned initially within the chamber of the Soul Stone, but as the first seal upon the first shard was broken upon the word and power, the very fires of hell rose and welled in all quarters. Belial was by my side with the sword in an instant to protect me from harm, but regretfully I passed out in the heat. When I awoke, it was on the grass verge besides the smoldering remains of the temple. As fortune would have it, the fire did not spread to my priestly shack by the river, and so all my most important papers still survive. What puzzles me, though, is how Belial managed to escape from the fire and the ire when fifty acolytes and priests perished in the resulting inferno. So apparently back in 1330, the Temple of the Morning Star broke the first seal. And upon this, the fires of hell rose and burned down the temple. Florentine escaped, as did Belial. And yeah, now we're hearing Belial's name being mentioned. Apparently Belial works for Florentine. Alf did say that Belial used to be a lieutenant, but no longer. Apparently this uh, journal is back in the days when Belial did work for Florentine. So they broke the first seal, and we've heard of we've heard of seals, haven't we? Those seals that uh that uh Adam was given back at the beginning of the game. It's probably talking about those. All right, let's go on to the next page. Claude Florentine, entry the morning of the 26th of January, 1330 AD. Temple Cottage. Have I made a terrible mistake? By taking the sword from the Soul Stone, have I inadvertently set into motion a series of events which I may be unable to halt? Is the sword some way connected to the Soul Stone? Belial cannot touch the thing at all for some reason. It burns me to the touch now, so much so that I have decided to place it in a place of safe keep. My immediate plans for the future are unclear for the moment, but through my contacts, one fact is clear. The first shard and seal are unmade, and the cause of the temple must continue. Belial has promised me acolytes from Europe who would be willing to travel to aid in the rebuilding of the temple. Favors owed, probably. I dare not speculate. 
So, even though the temple burned down, it sounds like things are going okay. The first seal, well, going okay for Florentine, which may not be okay for anyone else. The first seal was broken, which means that their cause must continue and that they're going to rebuild the temple, which was burned down. Though apparently there's something about the sword, which Belial cannot touch. It burns both Belial and Florentine to touch it. Let's go on to the next page. Claude Florentine. Entry, the morning of the 29th of January, 1330 AD. Temple Cottage. The sword has disappeared from the safe place in the cottage. I immediately suspected Belial, but then realized my mistake. Last even, he was as restless as a newborn foal as we sat convening in the study. He blamed his uneasiness upon the absence of the sword. I am beginning to believe him now. The thief will be caught. Caught and dealt with. Mark my words. So the sword was stolen. Which sword are they referring to? Well, we don't know yet. They're just saying the sword. Though we did see that drawing of Eternity, the dragon sword, so we might assume that that is the sword they're talking about. It also seems that Florentine did not entirely trust Belial. I mean, in an organization like this, I guess there's probably a lot of backstabbing. But, uh, Florentine does not believe that Belial stole the sword. Next page. Claude Florentine. Entry, the evening of the 15th of March, 1330 AD. York Library. The tower is as useful as is dangerous. Once this was not the case, but as I am one of the few who has traveled there and onto other realms in the pursuit of the Order's goals and lived, I can say with all sincerity that the crossings are fraught with all kinds of hidden dangers, even with minions to guide. The ire is constantly present within the tower, whether distant or near. Its unnerving ability to hunt and devour those who come to its place is astounding. I refer to a manuscript that I have had sent from France concerning the travels of a magician from the last century. There is no mention of any gardener or of the tower's past carnation, the manuscript being only a fragment of a much larger body. At first the dark, and within, I heard the fetid laughter of the souls of the ire. It came at once upon me like a storm charged with rage and gibberous song, hypnotizing and calling for sweet perdition. I ran, for I knew the tale of this forgotten place. I ran and stumbled upon the cracked pave of the tower, but it was always there, here and beyond, there and always, its face looming from the shadowy depths. From whence and where did this thing come? I knew as I fell upon the cold stone, the face of death smiling down. So Florentine, once again, is pretty preoccupied with the ire, because he has to use the tower to go to the other realms, and he's always at risk at getting taken by the ire whenever he does this. He has minions to guide him, but there is still danger. Next page. Claude Florentine. Entry, the evening of the 13th of January, 1420 AD. Temple Cottage. I fear the fire that ravaged this place when the second shard and seal was broken was from the same source as 74 years ago. Damn the light, and burn it from this place. If we are to lose more acolytes and severely deplete our monetary reserves to rebuild the temple each time this occurs, then we must postpone our endeavors for a while until the problem can be solved. Belial again, saving my life in the fire, has whispered to me of an otherworldly device that may aid the Order, but its location and power is shielded from him. We are therefore currently making the necessary plans to travel to Plymouth, and there pay for passage on some merchant ship to Israel. The threat from our old Templar Order there does not bother me so much now that its existence is speculative. If we make Israel in good time, I hope for us to meet there with the minions Gaziel, Fikor, and Honorigal, and bargain with them for their aid in our search. They are adept in seeking out the impossible and locating what is hidden. Hopefully our little setbacks will be solved for good. We make the journey south on the morrow. So apparently, the second seal had been broken, 
And when that happened, the temple burned down again, I suppose. <laughs> so apparently the fires of hell come up whenever the seal gets broken. And uh, they're going to have to do something about that because they're just going to burn down their temple every time they do this. So uh, Florentine and Belial are going to Israel, where apparently they're, they're going to find some minions and uh, perhaps help them out with uh, their little problems in breaking these seals. Next page. Claude Florentine. Entry the evening of the 7th of November, 1490 A.D. Merchant ship Osprey, bound for England. We are currently sailing off the southern point of Bornholm in the Baltic, and if favorable winds prevail, we will dock at Southampton on the 14th of this month. Our trek through Europe has not only proven successful in respect to the fires, but also we have been able to recruit to our order new members, some of them distinguished and rich. They have instructions as to where to meet with us in England in the new year. I look forward to their arrival. While in Madrid, I took the opportunity to call in on an old friend, who was able to disclose secrets of the tower from an old manuscript he had saved from the library before the Inquisition could impose themselves. As I sit here in this salt-stinking cabin, I cannot help but wonder on what Thomas had said to me so long ago, given what the scroll discloses. So this is going from England. This is not the trip to Israel. This takes place years later. And apparently from what, uh, what Florentine says, the trip through Europe has been very good for them in recruiting new members, figuring out what to do with these fires, getting more money, uh, more, uh, more people to their numbers. So it sounds like things are going okay for the Temple of the Morning Star, at least in terms of uh, 1490 A.D., Let's go to the next page, and the last page. Claude Florentine, Entry, 19th of June, 1521 AD, Temple of the Morning Star. The great power of the Shards has appeared to us. Thankfully, though Abaddon's reasons are his own, he has divulged the secrets of the Shards and Seals within the chamber of the Soul Stone. It is holding something back, I know it. I have confidence in this power yet. Something disturbs Belial, though again he is reticent. No matter how much I think that I know him, I am forever abated in my belief by his petty shows of secrecy. Speaking unto him, we have agreed that it may be for the best at this time, if the two do not cross paths. Belial is more than convinced of this. Of the tower, Abaddon has revealed much. The name Raziel has appeared in our conversation much, and this power appears to have place and dominion within the spiritual realm of Raquia for some reason. Abaddon has informed us that Raziel is a neutral power like himself, with the agency of imprisonment and freedom over those that transgress certain laws. I must speak with this power called Raziel at some future point, but a device for passage into Raquia, his realm, is beyond my sight. Abaddon will disclose sites and locations of these and all other devices, but I feel the cost of bargaining will be high. I fear I must agree to its terms all the same. The Egyptian mask and the other devices I now keep secure from the others. With this act, I can be sure that only I may tread the paths of the tower, unless permission is asked personally by others. So Florentine's journal ends at 1521 AD, and he says that things are going well once again. He's talking to someone called Abaddon, who is giving him all kinds of information. And uh, he's not sure, though, at what kind of price he'll have to pay for the information. We know about uh, Raziel now. He's the Lord of Raquia, and Raquia, it did sound like that's where we were going next. Raquia, uh, Raziel, I should say, has the power of imprisonment and freedom. We can also see that uh, Florentine has an Egyptian mask, which is how he is able to tra traverse the tower. So, this is Florentine's journal. It tells us a bit of the background of the Temple of the Morning Star and what they're doing. They're trying to shatter the seals. It seems to be their goal. These seals. There's six of them that Adam has, has, have? Adam has six, Adam has six seals. In the journal, it was said that two of them were broken. So, in the meantime, Florentine and the temple have been busy. They've broken four more. Is there anything new that they say about these things? 
I don't think so. What do you make of these fragments? You're not wrong. Yeah, I don't think they say anything new about them. But these are apparently are the broken seals from the journal. Six of them have now been broken. Now, let's have a look at these observations, because some new things have appeared. For example, there's the observatory. All the charts in the observatory show Venus. Venus. Yes, the morning star. It's another name for Venus. Yeah, I think we already heard that. Oh, actually, what I should say is we should look at the journal again, because we can discuss it. Now that we've read it, let's see what Adam and Rebecca think about the journal. We can click on this, and we can discuss the gardeners. I wonder if the gardener that Florentine mentions in the journal is Raphael. Or is it one of the others? Raphael did say he was the last. That means that there must have been more at some point in the past. If it is, it means that he's been around as long as Florentine has. Yes, it does sound like it. Uh, let's talk about them further. Evidently, the gardener that Florentine mentions in his journal is Raphael. Anything else in the journal to support that? On return from the tower, Pilar told Florentine that the gardeners had returned and that they were responsible for the deaths of the demons guarding the gates. It would seem that Raphael did have some friends. And it does seem that the gardeners are Florentine's enemies, as I, I suppose that the demons were serving Florentine and helping him get through the tower. Let's talk about the One Power. The One Power. The journal mentions the One Power. He's talking about God? The opposite. Florentine makes a reference in his journal to the One Power when a temple member goes mad and Florentine threatens to use him as some sort of sacrifice. So they sacrifice their members then. Nice way to do business. Right, so the One Power does seem to be the power that uh, Florentine is serving. And let's talk about the Temple of the Morning Star. This temple business, anything in the journal Anything I've missed? Seems to be some sort of religious order. According to the journal, there were more than just acolytes working for Florentine. It mentions powers, dark powers. So that seems to be everything that we can get from this journal. Let's go back to our observations now. And, uh, hey, someone new has appeared here. Claude Florentine, though he should look familiar to us. Claude Florentine, this Elias Camber fellow, his parcel and his lies, who the hell can he be? Claude Florentine, alias Elias Camber. According to these parchments, he was a Knight Templar and the priest of this temple, the Temple of the Morning Star. The first entry written in his journal is dated 1330, and the last 1521. Come on, Rebecca. That would make him nearly 200 years old. And with him being here over 500, that can't be possible. And nevertheless, it does seem to be possible. So now we've learned Elias Camber's real name is Claude Florentine. He did tell us previously that his name would not actually mean anything to us. And yeah, that was true at the time. But now that we've read a whole bunch of his writings, yeah, his name now has some significance to us. Let's reflect on him. Florentine. Claude Florentine. Alias that son of a lying bitch Elias Camber. What the hell's he doing here? More to the point, what does he want from me? Icon said that Florentine was right. Two would come. Do I have any say in what's happening here? Or my future? No subtitles for that last line. But what does Florentine want with Adam? That's been the question uh, this whole time. We do know that Florentine wanted Adam to get the Shrive, because I guess Florentine could not hold it himself. Uh, is there anything else to Adam's role here? If not, then why hasn't Florentine just tried to kill Adam? I mean, he did sick the skeletons on him, but it didn't seem like he was really trying that hard. It seems like Florentine is biding his time for some reason. We haven't seen him since then, either. Let's talk about the Chamber of the Soul Stone. Anything in the journal I've missed on this Soul Stone Chamber? Well, it seems to lie within a place called Shoal. Something went on there. Something involving a sword. 
and the fires of hell. True to form. Right, we did read about the breaking of the first seal, and apparently they used a shard, I think they said a shard of the soul stone to do it. Um, and then things went real bad when they did that. And now uh, the icon for Shoal appears here, which wasn't there before. This Shoal place. Know anything about it, Miss Trevisard? In the Old Testament, Shoal is the Hebrew version of the Greek Hades, hell, or part of it anyway. It's commonly regarded as the place where the dead exist, as shades, or as a place of torment for the wicked. You should feel right at home. Sounds like hell, all right. Raphael said it's possible to get there through the tower. <laughs> hell. This is crazy. Well, we don't really have to be concerned about it right now, because it did sound like our next uh, objective was Raquia, not Shoal. And speaking of Raquia, let's talk about the lord of that place, Raziel, who, as far as we know, is a speck of light. Raziel. He's apparently the guardian spirit of Raquia. That's how it reads in the journal. Raquia is Raziel's domain. What do you suppose he looks like? Any ideas as to what Raziel might look like? He usually appears as a tall man wearing black, the sound of chains and keys heralding him. However, his true form is as a monstrous humanoid with skeletal wings protruding from his temples. But that form is never seen except by those whom he keeps in his tower. Thank Christ. And Adam's very relieved at that. So, uh, Raziel is the Lord of Raquia and has the power of imprisonment. It does make sense, then, that that's where we would be going, since uh, Hawk did say that we need to find the means to free him from his prison. So who would know better than the Lord of Imprisonment, Raziel? But that's for later. And hey, here's someone we met today. Belial wanted the Shrive. Must have been part of his plan, whatever that was. It's over now. It might have involved Florentine. He was after the Shrive too, wasn't he? In the mausoleum? Yep, both uh, Florentine and Belial have now tried to get the Shrive from, uh, from Adam. But according to, uh, to Alf, Belial is no longer Florentine's lieutenant, so I guess they're both working for themselves. Belial. That piece of shit. That devious, pus-faced, evil mother. I'm clearly going to have to finish what I thought was done a long time ago. Despite appearances, he's still very impressed with himself. Bound to make a mistake sooner or later. I'll be waiting. So that sounds strange. What is Adam talking about when he says uh, that he's going to have to finish what he, st what he thought was already done a long time ago and Belial seems very impressed with himself? So I think the answer is that we're not actually supposed to get that observation yet because it doesn't actually make any sense for, from what's happened in the game so far. It'll make more sense later on, uh, but for right now, I think that it was too early for that observation to come up, because what, what is Adam even talking about at this point? So those are the, ob the new observations that we got from these uh, two chapters after reading the journal and, uh, and meeting Hawk and meeting Belial. So, we learned a good deal of the story. We know about Florentine. We know that for centuries he has been leading this Temple of the Morning Star in an attempt to break the seals for some reason. Belial used to work for him, but apparently is no longer anymore. We know that we have to get to Raquia to try to free Hawk. For some reason, it seems like he's on our side, but we don't really know anything about him. But maybe we could try to find out more about him, because there is one thing that we haven't done yet. If you remember when we went into that burned out house, there were some writing there was some writing on the wall. And uh we should probably go take a look at that. Let's go over there right now. Here we are. There were three walls that had this text burned into them. And uh, it's going to be a bit more relevant to us now that we've read the journal than it would have before. So let's go over this. The mind is stronger than most would believe, Florentine. Far stronger in the whole. It is man's mind that forms the creatures he sees around him. His thoughts and hitherto his creation. Thoughts move like waters against the rock, like hands at the clay wheel. 
forging and creating the shadows they see around them. Shadows of light, shadows of darkness, shadows from the soul. The minds that are strong, whether in virtue or flaw, create these shadows. The minions of all darkness and the avatars of all that is light. These creatures are the manifestation of the mind. They are whole only by man's thoughts, and the strongest of minds will create the purest of both. So do not say that these creatures are otherworldly, for they are not. They are part of man, as he is part of them. The projections of powerful minds. So it's a message to Florentine, talking about how the monsters are just projections of the minds of humans. So I guess this would talk about the monsters we've been seeing. They're the projections of someone's minds. Apparently, the human mind is the most powerful thing of all, creating these forces of light and darkness that we've been seeing. Oh, by the way... Florentine. Again. Must have been very fond of himself. We now recognize the portraits of Florentine as being Florentine. Though a weird thing is that Adam would have said the same thing if we clicked on this before getting the journal. I don't know how he would have known it at that point, but he would have. Let's look at this wall. So what part I hear you say, Florentine? Do the creations you call God and Satan calculate within this equation? Both are present, but both are without. These powers are the center of this world. It would be pointless to say otherwise. These powers are the sum total of man's thoughts, without form, for they are not fully conceived. They constantly germinate and die within the soul stone. They vie for the thoughts of man, and when one becomes the stronger, it will take on a form and come again into this realm. So you see... Both these powers are the sum total of this world at any one time, and until now have shared this place, but not for much longer. The world in which you live is becoming corrupt, and the pure thoughts of men are dwindling fast. It is to the dark side of man's mind that the path is leading, the road which is even now forming the future. Two will come, Florentine. Two men. So this message, I'm not sure if it's indicating that God and Satan are also projections of the minds of humanity. It might be. Those being the ultimate projections of light and dark and all that stuff. But at the uh, bottom of the wall, it does say that two people are coming. Hmm. Who would that be? Let's look at the third wall and see if we can get the, rem the, uh, the rest of the story here. Their names are Gaul and Hawk, Florentine. Timeless creatures who will focus the thoughts of man and make them substance through the soul stone. One is pure and without sin. The other, he is man's wickedness. These two creatures have fought for dominion for countless eternities since the soul stone fell to this world, but it is here, within and above this place, that the final battle will be fought. The battle that will dictate the eternal future of all mankind. Who will win, I cannot say, but the strongest will be the reflection of man's thoughts at that juncture. They are coming, Florentine. They are coming to this place. The seals that you have broken that once hid the soul stone have awakened them and alerted them to the stone. You have brought the last battle too soon, Florentine, and the universal balance has been shifted. Upon the four winds they come, Gaul and Hawk. The final battle. Florentine, you are a fool. So, this message saying that two people, Gaul and Hawk, will be coming to fight this final battle. One of them is light and the other is dark. Well, we've spoken to someone named Hawk, and so if we believe this, apparently uh, that person is one of the two, either light or dark. Doesn't really mention who is who. One of them is going to be pure and without sin. The other one is man's wickedness. So, we haven't met anyone named Gaul yet. But ha again, we've met someone who identifies themselves as Hawk. So, I guess we're going to try to free Hawk. I mean, if they're destined to fight the final battle, I guess both Gaul and Hawk would need to be free to be able to fight it. Regardless which one Hawk may be. But yeah, so we've seen these messages now. 
to Florentine from someone. I suspect it's Belial. I don't remember if they ever say for sure who wrote these messages, but I'm going to guess it was probably Belial when he left Florentine's employ. Uh, kind of angry, I guess, about what's going on, about Florentine starting the final battle too early. Uh, I guess it wasn't supposed to happen yet, but because the seals are being broken, that means that Gaul and Hawk are on their way to fight this battle. Uh, so, yeah, apparently that is what this is leading up to. It's going to lead up to these two guys fighting the final battle for all humanity on the line and all of that. Where is Adam's role in this? We don't know. What's Florentine's role in this? Apparently, apparently Florentine's role is to break the seals to cause this final battle to happen. Uh, but what exactly is it that Adam is doing? What is his destiny when it comes to this final battle? We don't really know yet. All we really know is that he was destined to be branded and to get the Shrive. And that's what he's done. But we have yet to see how that, how that plays into anything. So that's it for uh, the supplementary video, I think, for Realms of the Haunting Part 6. This was a long one, because there is a lot of information to read and talk about in this particular part of the game, and now that we're actually learning about part of the story. Not the whole story. There's still a good amount of story to go, but this has been the first big chunk of it that we've gotten so far. So uh, next time, we'll continue on. Uh, making our way through the house, trying to get to, uh, to Raquia. And we'll find out what more of the story we learned during that time. I'll see you then.